Hey, we've got a new bit of kit on the bench. Not new, old, new to me. At an Avantest TR6142. So to double check because there's a 6144, which is a higher spec model than this one. Uh, this is a programmable DC voltage current generator. And um, it's used for providing a, uh, a very precise voltage or a very precise current uh, for testing and calibration and what have you. Uh, this one, the 6142, is good for uh, about 12 volts and about 120 milliamps, I believe. Whereas a 6144 is good for about 32 volts at um, uh, 160 milliamps, I want to say. Something about that anyway. So you can dial it in volts, millivolts and milliamps and dial it on the front panel and switch the polarity back and forth as you need to. Turn the output on and off and it's got GPIB as well so you can control it remotely. And um, they're a quite a good little unit just for um, testing, you know, you can test your multimeters with them and you can, you know, calibrate bits and pieces here and there. But they're quite a, an, a useful unit if you can get your hands on one. I got this one for about 4,500 yen, just under 45 bucks uh, at my favorite junk store in Akihabara. And it does actually work. Um, I have another one, a, uh, the R6144, which is a later model and the higher spec model, but from the same store quite a while ago. But um, it doesn't work yet. Uh, that'll be the fe the uh, subject of a uh, upcoming video. So this one for now, um, this one does actually work. And um, I've had a little bit of a, a tweak with it like into my uh, key sight, uh, six and a half digit modometer, meter, and it, um, it seemed to work okay. So before we turn it on, of course, as the rules state, we've got to take it apart. So, let's dig these uh, screws out and um, see what we can do, what we can find. I do um, like these Advantest units. Some of them, some of the Advantest units, they're very hard to get uh, manuals for. So you've got to be careful when you buy an Advantest. Double check, you can get manuals. Advantest have a habit of... Um, just not providing manuals. So if you can't find one online and it's an obsolete unit, you might have a bit of a hard time. I've uh, asked them a few times for different bits of equipment and they're just like, nah, don't have anything. It's an obsolete unit. You know, go buy a new unit if you want m information sort of thing. I'm not sure why they don't supply old manuals, but they just tend to not. But if you can find an older manual, like a manual for an older unit, uh, they do make some very good equipment. So this is the top of the unit. I'll just zoom in a little bit. Maximise our real estate on the screen. So uh, we've got line input filter. It's a TDK, which is good. The old Schaffners tend to go up in smoke, but the TDKs are very good. A Japanese brand, of course, because it's a Japanese-made unit. Uh, line fuse. We've got a bulk filter capacitor here. Um, it looks like we've got our bridge rectifier and um, some uh, ceramic standoffs. Now these you've got to be careful with. Uh, I know especially with the Tektronix ones, um, in the older units I use these, uh, you have to use silver loaded solder or silver solder for these um, when you're repairing stuff with these uh, these standoffs because the way they make them to make the metal bind uh, to the uh, to the ceramic, they actually uh, sinter like a silver compound, it's like a silver loaded metal and the silver itself binds to the uh, the aluminum oxide, which is the um, the ceramic, and uh, gives you the uh, the terminal post. But if you uh, use a normal solder on that, the normal solder not having silver leaches the silver out, and you end up with delamination, and you'll destroy the um, the uh, standoff. And there's no way to repair that; you have to replace it. So you have to make sure you use silver solder. And also, if you even if you use silver solder, if you do it too many times, it itself will um, cause the same problem, but just a lot slower. So you want to avoid soldering onto these as much as possible, and if you have to, uh, do it quickly and do it as minimal as possible. Use a small amount of solder and um, just get in there and get out again as fast as possible. Just a little thing to be aware of there. So looking at the board itself, we've got our bridge rec uh, sorry, we've got our bridge rectifier here, another one, uh, probably for a different voltage rail, bulk capacitance there. That's a... Uh, not a Nichicon, a United Chemicon, or a uh, Nippon Chemicon, probably in this case, because it's an older one. Uh, SM series, uh, that's an obsolete series. That, uh, United Chemicon, Nippon Chemicon, they don't actually make, ra uh, not radial, axial capacitors anymore. They only make the radial style. But um, this is an SM series, which uh, 
it crosses over to the modern SMG series, I believe, and that's just a standard run-of-the-mill 85-degree rated uh, general-purpose capacitor. If it's a KM, um, they go across to a KMG, I believe, and that's a 105 degree. So the K is 105, the S is a uh, 85 degree rated cap. They didn't use 105 degree rated caps in here, I guess, because this is usually usually used in a lab setting, and um, you're not going to see high temperatures at all. It's generally going to be about 23 to 25 degrees in a lab, so um, there's not really any need to um, use high uh, temperature rated caps, so you can save a few dollars. Um, this unit doesn't really heat up at all either. So, yeah, no, not a problem there at all. Um, they are a very good uh, brand capacitor. So these capacitors are probably all fine. Uh, this one over here is a CEW. I believe the CE is um, the fact that it's a large can capacitor. The W means that it's um, it's got something customised about it just for the uh, manufacturer. Like at Vantes would have specified something about that. And the, I believe a W means it's got some something about it that's different from normal. Maybe it's a non-standard size or a non-standard um, uh, value or something. 16 volt, 10,000 microfarad. It seems, it seems normal, but there might be just like a packaging thing. Maybe it could even come down to the way it was delivered, like if it was in a real, not in a real, but in a certain carrier for mass production. Could be anything. There's no really real way to know what the W means in any real instance. So, um, Coming around here, we've got a, a, a voltage regulator, 7824, a 24-volt. Um, we've got a bunch of um, logic here, which is probably for the front panel controls. You've got a circuit board for the front panel. That's this cable here. Um, I'd say that's all the jelly bean parts, that, all the glue logic for the, uh, the front panel. We have an EEPROM, which will have the uh, firmware. Um, what is that? 27C128, so it's 128, that's about, usually you see 256, it's the capacity, so this is about half, um, which, judging by the age of the unit, is pretty standard. I mean, we don't really use uh, UV EEPROMs anymore, but yeah. And it's 25 micro, uh, 25 microsecond, picosecond, nanosecond, 25 nanosecond uh, access time. So it's a relatively fast one. Uh, We've got the, uh, these cables here actually come to the back panel for the GPIB, so this Hitachi chip is probably the GPIB interface. Uh, we've got a HD63A03RP Hitachi. That or this one, the uh, Texas Instruments TMS9914 ANL. One of those would be like the microprocessor or the uh, microcontroller. I'm not 100% sure. I'll put the information on screen while I'm talking uh, once I've got to editing this video. An interesting thing just here, this loop, I'm trying to figure out what that was, but I believe it's a handle. Um, so when you unscrew the board, you can lift it up using that little loop and not have to like try and finagle your way around and use like the chips or the heat sink to lift the board out. It's just maybe that's for um, a manufacturing thing. So they have a, a rack of these uh, boards and the, the assembler just grabs it by that handle and goes plonk, zook, 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 zook. and it's a way to maneuver the board around easily to uh, facilitate faster um, manufacture, which is a kind of a nice thing. I don't mind that. Add a, a couple cents, but probably um, save it even more in the manufacturing time. So that's basically the top. Not much else going on. It's just the uh, front panel controls, EEPROM for the firmware, the uh, logic and the uh, controller, microprocessor, whatever, you, whatever it is there. Oh, and this big black thing, that's the main transformer. Um, it's just got a part number on there that's a Advantes part number. There's no real information on the outside. It's just a black box with wires coming out, coming into the uh, connector there. On the other side is where all the good stuff happens. So um, you can see the transformer and the line uh, input filter there, the uh, ceramic standoffs. Over here we've got two, what I would assume are pass transistors, so that's what would be doing the actual output. The um, voltage reference and all that sort of stuff would probably be controlling those, and they would actually be giving your output voltage and your output current, I would say. So let's lift the lid, break the uh, warranty seal. I think I can live without warranty, seeing this thing is um, 
I don't even know how old it would be. Probably nearly 30 years old. At least the 90s, I'd say. UVE problems. Do we use those in the 90s? Maybe just a bit for, before then. Might have been uh, electronically erasable EE problems. All right, so yeah, on there you got all the uh, the labels for the uh, calibration. T 100 milliamps full scale, 1 volt full scale, 10 volt zero, 10 volt full scale, blah, 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 blah. That's all nicely labeled. And there is the goodness. That's what's doing all the fancy stuff. I'll zoom in on that board. So, what have we got? All these, th uh, like, yellow things across the top. There are range uh, selection relays. Uh, I'll get a, grab a pointer. Um, plastic one. I don't want to damage anything. So, uh, these things here, they kind of look like crystals. They're not. They're high precision, very low, even maybe zero temperature coefficient wire round wire wound resistors. Um, I know the Vichy make them these days and uh, they can cost 50 bucks a pop. I don't know if these ones are going to be that expensive but um, yeah often they're, they're in the middle can because they're often oil filled and yeah they're the uh, part of the secret source in this unit. The uh, really nice uh, resistors. So if you had a broken one of these that was not worth fixing they're worth keeping. Also uh, we have the op amps here and here, they're worth keeping as well. Um, that's what we'll be doing, like all the feedback and stuff to maintain the, um, the correct voltage on the output. Uh, common mode choke over here, that be for reducing noise and whatnot, probably stop noise coming back in or coming out. Uh, various pots for calibration. Let's have a look down here. Ah, here we go. This is the good one. This little white one just here. That is the LM399H. That's the voltage reference there. It's a, like a little mini ovenized kind of, um, or a temperature compensator with a little mini oven uh, Zener based voltage reference. And that, they were worth about 10 to 15 bucks each. I think Mouser at the moment, they've got them on back order. Um, but they're about 12 bucks a pop in single quantities. So yeah, that's, that's the, uh, the whole heart of this operation here. Uh, some little like flat style, uh, are they film resistors or something? So there might be semi-precision there. Uh, these ones here look like uh, precise resistors as well, 19.93 kilo ohms. I don't know what that one there is. Got a 20 ohm at the top there. Uh, what else we got? I'm not sure what these ones here are, if they're resistors as well, are they? They look like resistors as well in a weird package. Maybe they're wire wounds, the, but they might be less a less precision thing. Oh, we've got some nice tantalums too. These, oh, I'm not sure what type they are, if they're a wet slug or a dry slug. They look like they're end-to-end. -end. That's weird. Maybe they're uh, hooked up as bipolar? There's nothing coming out the middle of them, but usually there's like two sections. I don't know if you can see that on the screen. There's one section, there's a join in the middle, and then another section that's kind of heat shrunk with clear heat shrink. Usually it's just one section, and then you've got the leg coming out that goes into the circuit board. But these look like they're, they're mounted end to end. I think these ones are dry slugs. These are a little bit expensive too. These are nice. If ever you're replacing capacitors in your unit, you do, do not need to replace these. No, no, no. They very, very rarely fail. And they're kind of expensive to replace too. You can get them still, but they're like, yeah. It's kind of the aerospace sort of pricing. Like that capacitor could cost you 10, 15 bucks a pop. Um, the wet slug ones are even more, like 20 or $30 a piece. Um, but they're kind of very specialized. If ever you strip down some HP equipment, pull out all of these uh, tandems because they're valuable. So yeah, that's pretty much all we got in there. Basically you've got um, the voltage reference, it'll be feeding through various resistors uh, as voltage dividers or whatnot to then uh, create a voltage and then it's being controlled by the um, the feedback is being controlled by the uh, op amps. Um, that's all being fed in through the past transistors which is then giving you your actual output roughly. Also, Oh there's a, a chip over here, LM324N, that's another uh, op amp I believe. 
And if you look over here, this is a bit interesting. Just in, in here. See what's going on there. Two little round things, all the legs are going in of these um, capacitors and resistors. They're actually little Teflon uh, uh, mounting point. So you, they drill a hole in the circuit board and these things just kind of press in. And it's like a solder cup that's uh, surrounded by a Teflon kind of insulator. And the reason they use that is uh, a couple of reasons. One is it's easy to uh, like just tack in some parts and test the output and choose these parts. These may be selected parts that are uh, on the production line they they got a bunch of these and they put one in, not not quite in spec, put another one in. Nah, still not in spec, put the other one, okay, that's it, leave that one in there. And it'll be like a factory selected part. Um, I'm, I haven't looked at the uh, schematic or anything, so I'm not sure, but usually you'll see this sort of thing with a, uh, a selected part. Also, if you need something that's very low leakage, a, a connection that, you know, on a normal circuit board, you might get a bit of dust or, uh, you know, just on the circuit board itself, might not have the um, the the high resistance you need because there is um, a bit of leakage across the circuit board. Uh, the Teflon is very, very low leakage, very high um, insulation resistance. So you can use these things to get that. So I've got a, um, a HP Pico ammeter. And um, a Pico amp is a very, 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 very small uh, current. And uh, on the, uh, the input side where it's all critical, uh, like even the smallest amount of leakage, smallest amount of interference is going to throw off your readings. Um, it's got a, a whole bunch of these sort of things so that you can um, avoid any sort of leakage paths across the circuit board. There's a few other things that you can do, like with uh, guard traces and stuff. But um, I don't believe they're doing that. I can't see any guard traces in this circuit board. So yeah, that's um, basically what we got. Zooming back out again in our unit. So it's not overly complicated. But it is very effective. The new ones um, have a similar board, but it's it is different. It's got a lot more um, uh, dip packages like this one over here, uh, op amps and stuff, and it's a different layout because it's newer and they've redesigned it. Um, but we'll we'll have a look at the uh, 6144 in another time. For now, I think I'm not going to do much to this unit uh, because it works and the capacitors are like I said, uh, Nippon Chemicon or United Chemicon these days. And uh, there's nothing leaking. I can't see any leakage at all. And it seems to be within spec. So until it throws itself out of spec, I'm not going to go and replace the capacitors. Um, it's just not worth it. So it's time to give this thing a test. I've got it hooked up here to the Keysight 6.5 digit multimeter through some Pomona low EMF leads. Uh, I've got the uh, shield there that I put on myself, but I haven't um, hooked the uh, guard up. I don't really need to do that for this test. That's fine. Uh, I have de put deoxid on all of the connections. They're all clean and oxidation free. That's perfect connection. And I gave this thing a bit of a tweak to um, to recalibrate it compared to the multimeter. So uh, they it calibrated really well. The, it was a little bit tedious. I had to um, hold my tongue in the right position as as is normal, but also put on the correct coloured socks and waited for the right phase of the moon and uh, tweaked it, tweaked it some more, and even tweaked it a third time. And it's uh, come up really good. So um, I'm just going to leave it. There's nothing being changed inside the unit. It's all the original capacitors. All the original trim pots, everything's original. It seems to be working quite well. So uh, the specs say that it should be uh, recalibrated once every six months. And if you're doing something critical, that you need uh, good accuracy, you need to do it, uh, or you should be doing it every day. Um, I'm not going to be doing it every day because I'm not that keen. But um, I will calibrate it every couple of months just to open up, give, a, give it a quick uh, look over and uh, give it a tweak if I need to um, compared to the, the uh, key site. So... Uh, at the moment, you can see we've got it set to uh, 10 volts, 10.000 volts, and we are reading 10.000405 ish volts. Say that's uh, say that's a five is bouncing up between four and six. So that's our spot on. The uh, specs say that it should be 10.000000 plus minus 300 counts, so it can be 10.003 or 9.007. And we are well above that, um, well beyond that in accuracy. So that is perfect at the 10 volt setting. So if I go to the uh, 1 volt setting, I'll drop down one range. And uh, we have got 1.000001, 0, exactly 0. It's jumping up and down a bit. We'll let that settle for a little bit. But it's basically reading within a couple um, digits at the, at the back there. 
it looks quite a bit off because it's nine 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 nine, but that's like yeah, rounding down, rounding up. It's 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 real close to the actual um one volt, so that is not a problem there at all either. Uh, we go back down one range to the 100 millivolts, and um, we have got 100.004 millivolts. It's reading on the one volt range here, but that is also spot on. Can we go down once more to the 10 millivolt? There we go, 10 millivolt range. 10.0032. That's that's fine as well. So that is all within spec. So now we can uh, have a look. I'll turn the output off. At the, uh, we can have a look at the uh, current range. So if I plug it in there, and we go to DC current, and we want to set that to milliamps, and we'll go right up to the top to 100 milliamps, and turn that on. You let that settle for a little bit. And that there is pretty much spot on too. As good as we're going to get with this unit anyway. Almost exactly. If we uh, drop down a range to the uh, 10 milliamp, almost spot on. You can see that's bouncing up to a 10 milliamp pretty much exactly, so that's good. And uh, 1 milliamp. Yeah, spot on there as well. So this is working quite adequately. That is not a problem whatsoever. So that is good. That's fantastic. Not bad for the small amount that I paid for it. 3,000 yen or something, I think. Three, 4,000 yen. Works fine. Doesn't need a single capacitor, doesn't need a single part. Awesome. Just need a bit of a tweak inside and it's come good. So that's a thumbs up. Hope you enjoyed that. Stick around. Hit the uh, like and subscribe if you feel like it. And we'll see you in the next one.